Well, this morning we're in Habakkuk, Lesson 2. Last week, in Chapter 1, 1 through 4, you remember what Habakkuk, uh, what did he do? What was, what did Habakkuk do last week in 1 through 4? Justice. What kind of justice? What? Why did? Why did he want? What did he want justice on? stealing and cheating and uh, all the things to take, move in, take over your property or whatever and just do do all kinds of stuff and and uh, and so, so Habakkuk was he was complaining to the Lord because no no judgment come on those people and they it seemed like they was, were still flourishing right even though they were doing all this stealing and killing or whatever they were doing and uh, misleading people and mis and uh, taking advantage of people and does any of that kind of stuff happen today in our society yes we have a have a lot of that kind of stuff goes on we have people always trying to take Children trying to take their parents' monies away from them before they ever, before they die. We have, we have people trying to steal other people's property through legal means, and the law don't ever seem to do anything to those people, does it? it don't seem like they ever get caught or, or any, get any more than a slap on the hand. We have all kinds of mistreatments of animals and that's like that. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about now. That's the way it is now. Just like, and that's the kind of thing that's going on in Habakkuk's day. And that was 600 years before Christ, 625 years before Christ or something like that. And it was going on then and it's still going on today. So in verses 5 and 11, what did the Lord tell him? Did he tell him, he said, did he ask him, say, what do you want me to do? Or did he say, I have a plan? Yeah, I have a plan. So the Lord didn't ask Habakkuk's opinion, did he? Mm -hmm. Habakkuk was complaining to him. and He didn't say, well, what do you think I ought to do about it, did he? He said he had a plan. What was that plan? The Babylonian to come in and, and uh, uh, conquer Yeah, his plan wasn't wasn't just to go out and punish the the take care of the people doing the wrong, was it? His plan was he already had a had a uh, guy set up to become king, and he was going to invade Israel. He already he already had his plan in motion when uh, when Habakkuk was was trying to seek uh, judgment and justice. Was this group of people that the Lord was going to use come in and take over it, or were they going to be beneficial, or or how, what was they going to do? They'd be meaner than they was before. <laughs> They'd be more mean than the ones that was doing the meanness already. They uh, <clears throat> so uh, did uh, what? What did Habakkuk think about the Lord's? Plan. Uh, he, it, he didn't like the Lord's plan. He, he in fact, in in uh, twelve through seventeen, he he uh, voiced his opinion that he didn't think that was a good idea. <laughs> and uh, but the Lord didn't didn't consult him. Then we left Habakkuk waiting. 
and uh, he is uh, he's waiting on the Lord, and we left him left him waiting. Now, Gary, read uh, chapter two, verse one. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart. Watch to see what he will say to me. What I will answer when I am corrected. Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. Alright, so he's going so he's he's waiting and watching. What's he looking for? We're looking for what's what's going to happen to him when he's reproved. <laughs> he's looking for what's going to happen to him, right? He, he said, "He said I've questioned the Lord. I, he he had questioned the Lord, so now he's watching and waiting. And when I am reproved, so it, so he's kind of expecting the Lord to come back and you know and uh, <clears throat> tell him something. So he's." Uh, Norman, read 2 and 3, verse 2 and 3. Uh, then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on, on tablets, so that his, his, her, that his herald may run with it. For the revelation waits the appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not. Through all lingers, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. It won't be very long, will it? And the Lord answered me and said, So Habakkuk is waiting on the, his reproof for, for questioning God and, and criticizing God's plan. <clears throat> and God said to him, Write this vision and make it plain upon on tables that it may run that readeth it. What did the what did yours say in that verse say to you there, Gary? And this is King James. Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. That he may run who reads it. So this vision's got something in it that's going to, you know, it's, it's, you wouldn't really want to happen to you because if you read what this vision is going to do, then you're going to be wanting to move, change locations, get away from it, right? The uh, <clears throat> verse 3 says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie though it tarry that's though it's slow to come for it wait for it be you know wait for his plan to mm -hmm. to uh, come up because it will surely come it will not tarry so it's not gonna it's he's telling Habakkuk wait and when it comes write it down so there won't be no mistake about what it's what's being see it or, or for them to do and what's going to happen and it's you know it's sure to be there and it won't be too far in the future from what what that where they're having this conversation <clears throat> is god going to speak in unknown tongues in this in this message Or is he going to be plain and to the point? For this vision, it says in verse 2, and write this vision and make it plain upon tablets. So he, not, he don't want no misunderstanding and it's not going to be a confusing thing. <coughs> Turn over to 1 Corinthians 14, 19. Eighty-five. 
1 Corinthians 14, 19. spoke plain to his people and expected his people to speak plain in his behalf. <clears throat> the uh, 14, 1 Corinthians 14, 19, let's see how Paul felt about uh, when he was speaking to others. You want to read that, Gary? I think my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. So how does Paul feel about speaking in a roundabout way or in, a, in an off-colored way about what the Lord's going to be doing? He'd rather be plain about it. Mm-hmm. Paul would rather be plain about it. And the Lord was plain about it over here. And when you go to mixing words and then uh, mixing up the scriptures and stuff and taking one out of context over here and one out of context over here or saying then you might be speaking perfect English, but if you say it in such a way that it's not clear, the meaning's not clear, it's hard to decipher what you're really talking about, right? So... Even if you're not not speaking a foreign language or a different language or whatever, if you're if you're just saying a bunch of words in English, pretty soon there's the congregation doing what? They're just wandering around, looking around, you know, minds drifting, you know, and not you know, and, and they're not receiving uh, this, you know, anything. But so if you speak if you speak in a any kind of a, a language or any kind of a speech that's not clear and not direct and not understandable, then you're not speaking the way God speaks and the way he likes for his people to speak. And so when, when you hear somebody that's preaching on TV and he's, he's wandering around or something or he's saying something out of this over here, this over here, this out of context, he's not really speaking the way God would have his servants speak. And... God speaks plain. He expects his servants to speak plain. And he expects me to, he expects us to when we're witnessing and not not just go around in circles. Uh, verse 4 says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. What in the world is he talking about there? Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. What is that talking about? What is the Lord saying? If your soul is lifted up, he's talking about if an individual is is lifted himself up and has uh, has pride and he has uh, self exaltation, then uh, when he when he a person does that. When you lift up, he is not upright. What would be upright? If you if you have if self exaltation, you know, patting yourself on the back or building yourself up. If self exaltation is not the right way, then what is the right way? What is the right way? What would make you upright? God's way. God's way. What way is that? It says right the next part of that verse says, but the just shall live by his faith. So what does that mean, living by our faith? <clears throat> Put our faith in the brick wall, buildings, church house. Follow the Holy Spirit. 
Put our faith in the Lord, trust in the Lord to guide us with his Holy Spirit. That's his promise and his plan. His, his ultimate plan is to, from here, he's guiding and directing people toward Christ, to the birth of Christ, all, all the way from here and how to live. And he's saying, have faith in me, that the just and the upright lives by having faith in me. It's not what we do, our actions. If we have faith in him, we're going to act the way he wants us to. But it's the faith that in him and the not trust in him that cuts us off from him. We lose our fellowship because of not having faith in God. When you get out of fellowship, what do you do? How do you get back into fellowship? Repent. And let's see. Five and eight, five through eight. This is a pretty good little read here. I'm going to break it up. Norman, you read read uh, five and six, and then Gary reads seven and eight. Indeed, while wine betrays him, he is arrogant and never at rest. Because he is ready, as greedy as a grave, and the light of death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all of the nations and takes the captives of all the, the people. Gary, you want to read six? And will not all of these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his. How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges, will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will they not awaken who oppress you? And you will become their booty. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of People shall plunder you because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. Now, uh -oh. now, what's he talking about? <coughs> How does the prideful live? Like death. Like what? Death. Like death. They live like they're, death. They're never satisfied. They're never satisfied. If you get a, if, if you're prideful and you get a, you get you, let's say you always wanted a, a little piece of land. I'm not talking this is bad, but it's the greed of it that's the bad part. You get you want a little home, place to live, little property, security. And that, so that's that's okay. That's what you you know you wanted. The Lord provided that for you. But where do you stop? Do you stop there? Do you say, okay, I got this, now I want this over here. Mm -hmm. And then what if you decided that, well, I want this over here, this person's about ready to die, I believe I'll go over and get, get this done before the heirs get it, you know. What are you, what's happening to you? You're getting a little more greedy and a little more self-righteous type thing when you go to go to in our dealings and stuff. How should a guy deal with his neighbor? And how should a guy accumulate stuff? It's okay to own all, you can own all the world, half of the, half of the United States or whatever. It's okay to own all that, but how, how is it okay to own it? It's not okay if you do it by hook or crook, is it? No. So you want to, you, you can, you can accumulate under God's guidance and under his direction and the way he wants you to accumulate and use that accumulation the way he wants you to use it. And then everything's cool. But how does the majority of the people do that? You, you get a pretty good amount of money up, pretty good amount of holdings up. What do you usually do? What usually happens? They get turned really selfish. 
Most people turn really selfish when they do that. And every once in a while you read of somebody that gives, it's really multi-rich and they give a lot. But of the few people that are multi-rich and give a lot, statistics will show that while the rich people control probably 50 or more percent of the wealth of the earth, the ones that gives the most is the lower middle income groups, not the poor, not the upper middle income, but the lower middle income is the ones that's the least selfish and the ones that gives the most out and the ones that uh, you know, gives to charity the most. You'll read every once in a while about some guy, the rich guy, give $10 million to some project. And you'd think, oh, man, those rich guys really give a lot, you know. But on but statistics will show that those kind of gifts are really mm -hmm. smaller than what the average guys, the average people gives. So it's not accumulation of stuff, and it's not uh, owning stuff, and it's not, not, not that. It's how we handle it, how we live. If we accumulate that under faith and under God's guidance, that's going to be different than out of our greed, right? Mm -hmm. And that's and that's what he's talking about. He said, it's okay for you to live, but don't do it by hook or crook, you know? And that's what all these people were doing, this nation and then the nation that he's rising up to punch them. What happens when... Uh, when somebody does evil to somebody, what usually happens to, to that person that done the evil? What usually happens to him? What goes around, comes around, right? Right there in verse 8 says, Because thou hast spoiled many nations, because you went out here and took advantage of all these many nations. He's talking about the Chaldeans. He, the ones that he's rising up to, t to punish Israel. All the remnant of the people shall spoil thee because of men's blood and for the violence of the land, of the city, and of all of that dwelleth therein. So they're going to receive back what they're going to dish out. The Chaldeans that's going to invade Israel and take over, they're going to come back around and on the backside they're going to receive more punishment. And uh, so we see that what goes around comes around all the time. That's a, I don't know whether this is where that slogan come from, but whenever I read this, I thought, man, that sounds like they're, you know, this it's going to come back to the haunt them. You know, they're going to come in here and take all this over and punish, you know, and do all this stuff to Israel and all these other nations around there. And yeah, but the end result, they're going to come back and get worse than what they dished out. And uh, yeah. So when you, uh, when you're living your life, the upright man lives by faith, and not just faith in himself, faith in God. So when you do, if you're going to do something, if you do something good to somebody, what comes around? Usually good stuff comes yeah. back to you. It may not come back to you that day, you know, yeah. but, but you do something in the name of the Lord and do it good, good, and then you go on and behave, continue to behave. Don't go around patting yourself on the back saying, look what I've done for the Lord. Yeah. Then if you do something good for the Lord, it'll, the Lord will bring that good back to you. And so, so our actions and behaviors is... We, we have two ways of doing it. One of them is evil ways, un, underhanded, crooked ways, and the other one is to trust God. So we, get, we can do it under our own power, or we can do it under God. And that, that's a choice of it every day, and that's the choice of every person on earth, is to choose God's way or some other way. And... Uh, so if you choose God's way today, after, then you're, you put your faith in Christ, right? And you accept Him as your Savior, 
which means I'm, I'm adopting your ways. I accept you into my life to, for my, my Savior and my Lord. In the United States, we don't, we don't have a, we don't usually have a Lord or a Master over us like, like uh, they did in the olden days and like that. You'd have a Master, you'd do his bidding and like that, whatever he told you to do, you'd go here and do it. And then uh, in the United States, we don't have that. So our following a master or a leader is kind of awkward sometimes when you've been born several generations into this country where you don't have to, you have more of a law guidance instead of a, mm -hmm. a ruler, you know. So what? It, how do you live under Christ in a free society like that? Where you don't have a, you know, where you don't have a physical master. How do you, you know, Tim's our pastor, but he's not our master. How do you live under that kind of guidance? You have to trust Christ. Trust the Lord. When God sent Christ, he provided us a way to where we could communicate and find out God's will for our lives by praying through Christ to God and then through the Holy Spirit he gives us back an answer and I, the Bible says that Christ is light light travels pretty fast so if you think a prayer Lord help me in this situation show me what you want to do it doesn't take long for it to go to God come back to you before you can if you, but you have to wait on it you don't have to wait very long, but you do. Have, it says wait on the Lord. You ask and then wait. And it doesn't take a week or a month most of the time. You think a prayer, Lord, what, what would you have me do here? What you would have me say? It's like, say, I'm with you and, get, and say these comforting words. You know, it, you just wait a split second and the Lord will supply you the answer. The... Uh, but when uh, here he is going to reprove the Chaldeans on the back side of all their whatever they do and we got some woes coming up we had some woes in Revelation that was pretty, pretty bad pretty bad woes right <laughs> uh, read 9 through 11 there Gary you got it Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples in sin against your soul. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the timbers will answer it. Yes. Yeah, see, it's not whatever, you know, when you do something evil and bad, you know, it's going to be found out. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a woe is like, uh, you know, that's a warning, isn't it? It's a woe to you. If you do this, you're going to get, you're going to get, <laughs> if, if you have evil covetousness, anything to do with stealing crookedness or either, that's not God's way. You know that automatic. You don't even have to pray, Lord, what I do if I'm going to have to lie to get this piece of property? Cheat or steal, that's not God's way, is it? You know? Get it underhanded or whatever, that's not, or force somebody out, that's not God's way. It says, we have another saying that whatever you do, it'll all be found out, you know, before before your death, it'll it'll be found, it'll found out. And it says here that for the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. So, you know, that's what that's talking about. It's whatever you do is going to be found out. And then verse 12 through 14 says, Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood and establisheth a city by iniquity. So this woe is against somebody that goes in and overthrows a government and then, uh, and then kills, you know, and it, and overthrows it in the in a war type thing, whether it's a 
household or a, or a government or any, you know, like, or any of those kind of things. Like, it says, Behold, it is not of the Lord of the hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire and the people shall weary and the people shall, and themselves for very vanity. For, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So it's not of the Lord to do those things. And eventually the Lord, all of the glory of the Lord will be all over the earth and all over the sea. Read uh, 17, Norman. Uh, the violence you have done to Lebanon will overcome you, and your destructions of animals will terrify you. For you have shed man's blood, and you have destroyed lands and cities and every, everyone in them. So this one is saying, along with these others, is saying, you done all these things, woe to you, it's going to come back on you. Read uh, 18 through 20, Gary. What profit is the image that, it, that its maker should carve it? The molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make new idols. Woe to him who says to wood, awake, to silent stone, arise. It shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. But the Lord is in his holy temple, and all the earth keeps silence before him. Uh, what's he talking about here? What's, what's he say? What, what profit to the graveth ima image that the maker thereof hath graven it? What is he talking about? False gods, right? Yeah. These yeah. false gods and making images of false gods. Mm. You know, what do you, you know, does God want an image? False made it made of him? Mm. No, he don't want to take no wood or gold or silver and make an image of him, does he? What profit is it? To, to making these idols and the teacher of lies and the maker of his work trust us therein to make the dumb idols. Idols are not too intelligent, are they? No. When you see, we see here we have uh, had various kinds of idols come into the United States. One, one of them, you, you see a little short fat guy sitting around on a, on people's mantles or something mm -hmm. like that you know and uh, and that's a that's an idol that's you know buddha is is mm -hmm. not a is, you know they're not those graven images is not of god and uh, people that worship those or have those around them they have a they're they're if they say, oh, no, I go to church every Sunday, but I have these over here. That's what he's talking about. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. It's God only, and our faith should be in God only. And it's true, he's invisible, but he is not unfeelable. You can feel his presence. You may not can see him, but you can certainly hear him, and you can know he's there. And with a graven image, you can see him, but you can't never feel it because he don't have any feelings. He don't have any way to express itself. And uh, so there's, there's profit in having God because it benefits us to have a better life because we can talk to him personal, experience a feeling with him. Uh, and, but with idols, it's just vanity. You know, and vanity is what, like a breath of air, just poof, gone. The, uh, 
Verse 19 says, Woe unto him that saith to the wood. He's, he's saying the guy that makes this idol has got a problem. Woe unto him that saith to the wood, Awake, to the dumb stone, arise. Idol makers are going to have some explaining to do. But I don't think God's going to listen to them with anything except a deaf ear unless they repent. That's the way he does everybody, though, isn't it? Yeah. He only listens to you when you're ready to repent. When you call on him in a spirit of repentance and humbleness, then he will rid all these other things out of your life if you follow and continue to trust him. And putting other gods in his place is probably the worst thing any human being can do for themselves. If you want a direct line of condemnation, just worship idols. That's the end. That's how you, unless you fully repent and fully abandon that practice, you're, you know you're, you have a one-way street to hell. That's uh, that's you know idol worship and things like that's just just not good, no way. So we see in this that when we live the way we live our lives should be by faith under God and when we look at chapter 3 next week we'll see what Habakkuk found out about that and we need to live our lives without idols without false gods and live it in an honest respectful way toward our neighbors no matter how much holdings we have or what we have it's how we use it and how we got it and how we followed God in doing those things. Grace the Lord, thank you for this day, and we thank you for watching care, and just thank you for giving us an opportunity to study your word and providing it for us that we can understand how to live and how to grow in your likeness, and just ask you to guide and direct us, and if there's anyone here that needs you as their Savior, Lord, I ask you to kindle their hearts and then inspire them to come and, and join your fellowship and follow your ways. In Jesus' name.